The Plan Air Easton podcast is brought to you by the Avalon Foundation, enriching the lives of those on the eastern shore of Maryland through the arts. Visit avalonfoundation.org for details on events, performances, and educational programming offered throughout the year. Today's episode is sponsored by JFM Enterprises, providing distinctive ready-made and custom frames and moldings to the trade since 1974. Visit jfm.net to view their catalog of designs. That's great. I will I will engage in my conversational and not boring lecture mode. <laughs> I'm sorry you don't have a boring lecture mode. Can I just get the uh, the the pronun- just correct pronunciation of your is it Marciari? So, um, you can pretty much say whatever you'd like, but I usually say Marciari Alexander. Marciari my husband says Mar- Marciari. My father-in-law says Mashiri. My kids <laughs> say Marciari. <laughs> I, I so I'm Alexander with that in the middle. So you can, it, it, whatever trips off your tongue. Marciari Alexander, Marciari Alexander. Marciari. 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 You too can pronounce it different ways, the two of you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Plenary Easton Podcast. I'm Tim Wagon with... Hey, I'm here too. This is Jess Bellis. Jess Bellis. Um, Jess, we had a very interesting conversation with... Uh, Julia Marchiari uh, Alexander, who was, um, or she is, the jurying uh, judge for Plenary East in 2020. Right, so she chose the 58 artists that are um, participating in this year's competition. Well, I guess not 58, because we've got a couple of invitations, and um, she's going to be our judge next year in 2021. Right, and she talks a little bit about, in the interview, about how she picked um, the, the, the eventual uh, entries for this year's competition, but she also talked about her start in the arts and you know, very, very interesting uh, career she's had. Absolutely. I appreciate that Tim says that we talked to her, but mostly I ran my mouth a whole lot and listened to um, her incredible, articulate answers. It was, it's really... Um, it was inspiring. It really yeah, was. yeah, and I, mean, I, I hate to disparage our other um, yeah. our, our guests in the past, but this, we're is, not doing. this is probably the smartest person we've ever talked to. Maybe the smartest person I've ever talked to. Definitely the smartest person I've ever talked to over Skype, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Plenary Air Easton podcast, Julia. We're so glad to have you here. And, and Julia, your official title right now is the Executive Director and CEO of the Walters Museum. Is that correct? It's the Walters Art Museum, and I do have a named title, but... Um, um, Give it to us. Come on. We want to hear Andrea it. Andrea B. and John H. Laporte, Got it. executive awesome. director and CEO. Because they have endowed the position? Yes. It's part of an endowment? That's excellent. Exactly. So that's nice. That's more than just nice. Julia, tell me a little bit about yourself. And, and you know, we want to talk about modern times, but I, I have a real fascination with um, childhood education. And I just wonder, when you were a kid, did you love art? Like, is this, did you have art passion from when you were tiny or not really? Okay, so I think that I was not ever one of those kids who liked to do crafts. And I have to tell you that I'm still not a, a big you know, I like to go home and draw kind of person. I like to doodle sometimes, but what really, how I really became who I am today is because I'm fascinated by the interconnections of art and history and the lives of people and the lives of objects over time and how all those things interact. So how society um, uses art to its own ends, how individuals represent themselves in art, how history is um, written one way because of people's use of art. so that I'm, I'm much more of what I'll call a cultural historian um, with a focus on art rather than um, other aspects. Again, I'm a, 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 we, we uh, run the Plein Air Festival, of course, and we also run a live music venue. I mean, I consider myself to be an art lover, but not an artist. You know, I'm an, I'm an arts administrator, so I can really identify with not um, picking up the, the, the paintbrush or the instrument, but really having a deep appreciation. But can you remember a time, you know, in high school or middle school when you started really seeing those connections? 
Yeah, there's a very specific moment when uh, my family, I had the opportunity with my family to go to Europe over Christmas of 1979, 78, 79, that holiday break. And we went and saw lots of beautiful museums and things, which was fine. Um, my sister was an art history major in college and I was in sixth grade. Um, and okay. this wonderful big sister would take me through the Uffizi and show me all these amazing works of art. But it was really on New Year's Day, 1979, when my father and mother had procured tickets to Mass. And we are not Catholics, um, although I did marry a Catholic. <laughs> we went to Mass in St. Peter's, and it was John Paul II's first um, New Year's Day Mass. In, in Rome and so there were huge crowds in the in the cathedral or the basilica and I remember being in that space with all what the Protestants would call the bells and whistles of Catholicism but really moved by the interactions again of people of the space of the incredible mosaics of yeah. the sculpture of the um you know, all of the, the chapels and the graves and the, um, everything was coming together in this lived moment when the art from the past was very much alive in the present and shaping the future of the people who are in that space. And Absolutely. so for me, it was that moment um, that I still think about and why I love working in museums because it's everyone has an opportunity when they walk into a museum to experience a space yep. to experience individual works of art and to do that with other people and that live moment is yeah. is where the magic happens and you can experience that moment every day at work i guess right <laughs> I, I wish that that were the case i yeah. haven't spent too much time in my office but I, I i aspire to doing that every day <laughs> don't don't we all no that's that's wonderful i can i could picture that moment when you were saying it i I can see all. I, I, I could. I can picture a little version of you connecting all of those dots. It's a very fascinating answer. And so, and I've never uh, thought about that at all before. But you, you know, you're all. I mean, so you're talking about the whole feeling of the museum and being around them, and 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 along with the artifacts and all that. Just that whole feeling of it, which is is that is that what you're kind of mentioning, and and saying that you spend yeah. so much. Yeah, it's really incredible. It's, 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 and you wanted you 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 realize that at. John Paul II's first, right, first Christmas. New Year's Day Mass. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I mean, I had all sorts of That's opportunity awesome. in that moment. And I remember my dad got this great photo. I have to try to find it, um, where John Paul II was doing his little um, hand blessing. And the light from through the clear story windows actually hit his hand. And it looks like he, light is coming off of his hand right, and I yeah, thought you know yeah. that's how people make these amazing stories about um, how art can actually um, influence religious and spiritual belief and yeah, you know that was just my dad with his camera yeah it's, that's it, very, uh, that's it was very amazing it was an amazing moment but I also think that um, you know, we know that what our contemporaries really want is experiences. You know, you hear about don't give your kid, kids gifts, give them experiences. Absolutely. And I think we can all do a better job of talking about going to a museum as an experience that is not just one where you are receiving knowledge, but you are actually part of the interaction and the experience that that enlivens every single aspect of what happens in a museum um you you as a person uh, make it come alive so and let, let, let's talk about that because you're you're at the walters and you've been there since 2013 or so it's been a, it's been a while your feet are solidly under you and the walters has a has a mission I, I read that you guys are open free and open to the public and you have sort of a very inclusive and open um mission statement um can you talk a little bit more about that Sure. We um, we really believe that we want to bring art and people together for learning, discovery, and enjoyment. And that happens as we collect and preserve and steward the objects from the past. But we do that in order to strengthen community in our present and use those objects. I would say we, we use the incredible 
buildings that we have, the the objects that we house, and the expertise of the people who who live and work here. Um, we all want to use these assets to make a better Baltimore and make a better Maryland and make a better, you know, humanity. So and to, to allow we, people to have the kind of experience that you have, I mean, it had, I mean, again, to, to be, to be immersed in it, for it to be, to be, for it to be an active experience. I mean, that does make sense to me. Yeah. And, and one of the great things that our current trustees and um, the past trustees and, and frankly, our founders have done for us is to give us the mandate that we are to be free and not just on site, but also online. So you can download a, a digital image at high resolution and do whatever you want with it. Um, that's part of our open access philosophy. And it's in order to allow for there to be as much room as possible for you to engage with, with us on your terms. Um, that's so exciting. And not just on ours. Can you give me an example of a program at, at the Walters right now that really resonates with you or that is a passion project of yours that makes you feel really happy and engaged in that way? Well, we have one of the just best school programs um, in a museum in in America. Actually, we're a leader in museum education, and we serve almost uh, 10% every year of the Baltimore City schools and then l more widely, about 50,000 school children a year. And that's elementary school or high school? All the way up. Um, actually, schools from nursery schools all the way up. And actually, we have programs from zero. Um, we call it lifelong learning. But our yep, real house sure. is really zero through about 12 or 13, we are starting to have more robust high school programs. What we also have, which I love, are te um, teacher training programs. So one of the things that I feel just so passionately about is giving these Maryland school children opportunities to, en to engage with our collections, but not just doing that you know, here on site, but we help teachers understand how they can use art to teach things as broad ranging as physics and math and science. And, and there's so many studies about about how that you, using art to teach some of those core uh, curriculums, it both uh, makes for better test scores is, you know, obviously more engaging. I mean, I'm an arts person. So Absolutely. of course, I and think it's it is not just about art making going back to our the beginning of our conversation, art, right. you know, using art and thinking about art as creativity embodied um, is how we learn best as human beings. And it really isn't just about you know, making something. No, that makes that makes a lot of sense. So we, so we sort of jumped from you as a child all the way to you being at, at the Walters. Talk about some of your experiences in between. Oh, my goodness. Well, you had I, a lot. You, you got a lot of education. You took that passion do, to, into the classroom, right? Years, exactly. Spent a lot of years in school. Um, I had this kind of um, glorious opportunity to live in Europe and live in Paris. And I thought I was going to be a French person. Um, and then during that time in my twenties, I was able to really think about how art in that kind of older civilization, um, not in America, which is an incredibly, um, new westernized country. It's not a new country and by any stretch of the imagination, but you know, in terms of my experience, um, as a white Western Christian, you sort of Euro European. Um, but I was able to really think about how art, again, how, how people lived with art, over time. And so these objects and buildings and places and cities are these palimpsests um, of, of information, of creativity that's been left or discarded sure. or built upon. And I just loved that so that when I came back from my um, post-college, pre-graduate school couple of years, what I really was interested in was how can I as a human in the 21st century or 20th century at that time um, connect with some of my forebears in um, England and in France in particular and how can I use information about the kinds of art that they lived with or the ways that they represented themselves to help me understand better my own condition in, sure. in 19 then you know in the late nine you know it wasn't the late 90s sure so, so I what was your path? really enjoyed yeah. And so that's what I did. And then I became a museum curator. Gotcha. 
and, and and what kind of discoveries did you make about yourself through that process, though? I mean, you, you, you were beginning to talk about something that, again, felt kind of personal, that you were, you know, sort of looking to the art of your ancestors. You know, what were your takeaways? Well, I, so my, um, my, my academic subject is portraits of women and how women's roles in the creation of those portraits because they are not traditionally the artists in the 16th, 17th centuries, um, means that it was thought that they were just objectified. And so my dissertation, my PhD, was on the ways in which these objects that we have, about which we have very little written um, evidence or text, um, actually are incredible embodiments of the ways that these women grabbed what little power, what little autonomy, what little subjectivity they could create around their existence. Um, And these were elite women. These are not my ancestors, frankly. (laughs) (laughs) But these were elite women working at court. And as I started to dig into into that subject, I began to realize um, just how interesting it is to see how power um, is wielded when it's not wielded from the center, but from the sides. Got it. And how people who are disenfranchised, disempowered can actually and do often control things from the, the outsides um, when they have no legal or other means to do uh, so. Julia, like how did you discern that from the portrait that you were looking at or the portrait you were studying you can't do it from one painting and um you have to have a a, a number of them and and the woman that i worked on was um very much like in our world um sort of madonna or now lady gaga this woman who had herself painted over and over and over and i use that term that she had herself painted by the painter, um, the main painter to the king um, in Charles II's England, so 1660s. She was the king's mistress. She was the mother of six of his children. His wife had no children. The queen had no children when they were together. And she just had herself painted in all of these poses um, that were asserting um, roles that have meaning if you read what's happening in the courts and the politics of the time, she was creating stories around her role at court. That's incredible. So to the point at which, you know, one of her portraits, the queen's name was Queen Catherine, and this woman has herself portrayed as St. Catherine, right? So <laughs> his mistress. Or, She's like, take that. What have you done yeah, for me exactly. lately? <laughs> or she has herself portrayed um the second major portrait that she has done, she's working with this one painter. So I can say that it's like a transaction. You know, you don't go to the portrait studio now and take a paint, get a portrait of yourself done and just say, thank you very much to the person. You talk to them, they get to know you, they figure out how to capture some aspect of your personality in the painting or the portrait, the photograph, so that it looks like you or it resembles some part of you or it resembles the part of you that you want to convey so that's an area where they were no different clearly and um so she in creating working with this artist to create a picture of herself as saint catherine i mean that's pretty obvious say, no she didn't <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly so i and and what was really fun at that time when people would say oh my gosh well old art it really doesn't matter but this was exactly the moment when Um, Camilla Parker Bowles was moving into the limelight and Princess Diana's, um, you know, she was being pushed aside. Sure, you're like history repeating itself in its own way, of course. (laughs) Monica Lewinsky. Yeah, sure. (laughs) It does. Those symbols repeat over and over again. They do. Exactly. So that's where I was able to kind of make these connections for people who otherwise would say, well, 17th century portraiture of women, it really has nothing to do with anything. And then, you know, Annie Leibovitz comes out with her Monica Lewinsky spread of Monica Lewinsky in all these historic 
poses and you just right. say, mm-hmm, actually. Actually, people have done this before. <laughs> this is not the first time. It's nothing new. And, and, and right. then I guess, I guess just to kind of bring it around to your current, to your current, once you study and you, and you, and you study that hard, it, it makes you uh, uh, certainly qualified to to run museums or, or however get into the museum world, which is what you what you did uh, from all that. Right, and I worked in an academic museum at, at Yale for twelve years, and then um, I really decided that my um, my calling was to think about ways to bring um, sort of the highest level of thinking and and make these really interesting connections for the most people. And so working at San Diego and the San Diego Museum of Art, trying to open up that collection um, and make it accessible for and we and we were we were talking we were talking earlier that some people might say oh you know Julia's at the the Walters Museum and they don't really have a a, a deep collection of plein air paintings or really representational art they've got a great figurative collection but what is she really doing and your sort of answer back is that you really did experience a lot of um, both plein air art and even part of the you know the modern plein air movement when you were out in San Diego. Yeah, that's kind of is that a correct statement? Absolutely. So leaving the kind of ivory tower of Yale and then going into San Diego, where some of the greatest plein air painting um, ever in the 20th century occurred. Sure. Um, you know, William Wendt, Maurice Braun, uh, Charles Rifle, one Absolutely. of my favorite the exhibitions that we did at the San Diego Museum of Art. And one of my favorite books is a book on Charles Rifle. Um, and I was not the curator, nor was I the author, but I was in charge of the project. And yeah. it's it was just so incredible to see how national that moment of plein air painting was and yet how specific to place um, these amazing plein air painters can become attached. So you have somebody like Rifle who's in, in you know, Connecticut at Silvermine and then goes to, um, then goes to San Diego and, and, you can t- still tell it's a rifle, but you absolutely know where it is. The essence of San Diego the and place. Of mine in his paintings. Well, and again, I think that that's something, you know, you have not had the, you haven't been able to come out and, and experience Plein Air Easton for yourself. I think that you will this year. But, you know, it is all the things that you're talking about, about ex- experiencing art in, in the moment and connecting to the, the art itself and the place that it's being created. You know, Al always says, oh, you can smell the turpentine. But it is a, a real connective experience um, being able to sort of look at so many of the places that you love and landscapes that you love through somebody else's lens. It, it does give you a whole new appreciation for that space, for that artist, for the way both that space and the art itself makes you feel. It is a connective experience for sure. At least it has been for me. Absolutely. And I would even say that um in the same way that I think of portraiture as a transaction between the sitter and the artist, I think that plein air painting more than most other um, types of sort of academic painting, more than many other types of painting, is really a transaction between the landscape that they're painting and the the artist, and then also the viewer, right? Right. So you bring to it as a viewer your own relationship with that spot. So it's it's additive, it is participatory, it is um, just such a a, a lively, engaging um, experience when to, to stand in front of a plein air painting. Um, I, I just love it. No, we do too. So, so I know our, nis- our listeners want to hear, and you don't have to, um, you don't have to give away all your secrets. But I know that judging any or during any show is incredibly. Um, uh, difficult and time consuming. And, you know, as you well know, we have hundreds of applicants to this show from all, all corners of the globe. Talk to us about what that experience was like this year. You know, you open your computer up and you say, okay, I got to look through these images. Like, what happens next inside your head? So every time I say yes, I think to myself, I'm not doing this again because it is so <laughs> wrenching. It's so wrenching because you, and particularly with this um, this jurying process or judging process, 
everything was amazing. And so it really was trying to find um, basically connections that I found. So it was a very personal process. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did try to, as I often do, to create a final selection that is representative of the broad range of styles and motifs and um, techniques, uh, as opposed to really narrowing, honing in on, say, oil. Or so I, I always try to to create a grouping that at the most macro level represents the broad range of the original selections. Um, and then I love to just, you know, in the end, I end up choosing favorites, right? <laughs> well, I think that that's what everybody has to do. I mean, you can, you can maybe um, discount a certain percentage just based on it not meeting whatever your standard might be, you know, whether it's color or composition or technique or whatever. And, and then you're kind of left with the rest. And like you said, you can, you can, oh, you can satisfy all those things that you were talking about and have the range and you still might have some spots left that you want to agonize over, right? Right, right. And I think um, this was actually both one of the hardest and one of the most satisfying um, processes. So um, again, it, it, it just kind of fell into place. And I think maybe that's because I'm a little bit self- more selfish and decide, you know what, I am the juror. So I get to choose what well, I want to do. You know, the, you know, Plenary Easton is in its 16th year, and we've had a lot of um, f- feedback in the past, some negative that we have a w- one jurist, one judge system, that, that that's not fair, you know, because you can always complain about judging or jurying, right? Like, it, it's always right. open for that. You're doing um, it. You can't, you can't say anything. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, we love it being a singular person's vision like that, because if you do have to sort of answer to a, pa- a panel, I think it really it takes off those edges you were talking about. It brings everything a lot closer to the middle. Um, and it doesn't it doesn't allow for as, as much diversity, I don't think, as when it's somebody who exactly, you can sit there and say, you know what, I don't even really know why I like this one, but I really do. <laughs> like, well, and I, you know, I'm just going to be, I, I feel sort of sorry for, is it Dan Weiss, who, who's the next or someone? I don't know. Yes. The next so Dan, Dan Weiss is the one you, you juried people into this year's competition and it's up to him to judge the results of their painting that will take place here in July. Right. So rat rat on him because I got to choose the first round. <laughs> <laughs> well, he got he got to he got to do that two years ago and uh, dump it all on David Levy. So, um, <laughs> right, right, right. and you'll have the same experience with whomever is the the jurist next year um, when you come down and judge. So, um, I, I think that that one is hard. That the the judging process because I have walked with the judge for many years is is agonizing on a whole whole different level but we won't we won't talk about that now we don't want to scare you off again at this point they're judging something that someone else judged and they didn't even have the the opportunity to argue a point right whereas in a jury situation i think why you do end up with things in the middle is that it is you know you're horse trading or you're you're having debate that someone wins um and you know that's not the case here. When you are putting your eyes on a painting, whether it's whether it is a, a, a an old class, classic or or a, f- a fresh new oil, what are the things that your eye is using to evaluate that art? What do you go to first? Um, I'm going to answer your question slightly differently. Sure. My husband, who's a curator, and I spend a lot of time in museums playing the silly game, which muse- which painting would you take for the museum, you know, uh-huh. capital, capital M, and or which object would you take for the museum, and then the other half is which object would you take for yourself? Right home. And I love it. <laughs> I, I think that that is always where I'm toggling um and i you know i think the standard for both is that something has to be arresting doesn't always have to be pleasing but you have to be drawn in um, and engaged by the object doesn't always again doesn't always have to be pleasing sometimes being disturbed actually is as powerful as being drawn in through a pleasure. <laughs> That's um, kind of more point. for your museum piece, but not so much for your kitchen, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly, uh, exactly. And so, you know, I think where I would struggle is in thinking about this selection. I couldn't tell you which ones 
were more for the museum and which ones were more for me. I'm sure when I was doing it, there was something in my head. Yeah. But, um, you know, I do have a few favorites. I love, I love that. <laughs> tell me about tell me about the um, your actual collection that you have at home and you don't have to be specific about it. But what, what does make the cut? Do you and your husband often agree or not? Or there's a sampling of both? As far as I'm concerned, it can be your kids' art, too. Like, I've got plenty of that framed on the wall. <laughs> yes. I do have some framed objects that my um, children have done. And, in fact, my favorite works are two watercolors that they did when they were maybe six. And they were done at the summer camp at the San Diego Museum of Art in response to the major exhibition of Howard Hodgkin's work that I had curated. Oh, how awesome. And so it's this multi-layer of me and my relationship with Howard Hodgkin, a contemporary um, now. He he died, uh, I think, last year or two years ago. But um, that relationship, which was longstanding, and then their relationship with his art and with him. And these watercolors are just amazing. So those are my two favorites. But maybe well, and, we- and that's, that's so symbolic. Of, of your own personal journey too you're looking at the object that tells all, all of the story and it is um, immersive and connective as well so that's a again a perfect answer that is right and I will say that my husband's art, art that I tend to like is either abstract or portraits uh-huh. um, and we have some prints of um, some you know some prints that that are 17th century of the women that I worked on. Absolutely. But my husband has a much more um, literally Catholic taste, and he's <laughs> a specialist in Italian Renaissance painting, so he's the one who brings in any religious work uh, gotcha. into the house. <laughs> <laughs> Not because if, he's religious himself. If, if we would, it's in him deep somewhere. We'd be like, oh, that's one of his. That's one of hers. <laughs> yeah, you could, you could literally go through the house and, and do that. Um, it's been so great to talk to you today. Um, Julia, we can't wait to have you come down this summer and, and check out our event. Had had you heard of Plenary Easton before you got the phone call? I had because I, I know some artists who really enjoy submitting and, and getting in. I have no <laughs> idea whether they're in the mix of the people because I didn't see any names. So, you know, that was that was good. But I know it's something that is well beloved of many people here, um, not on the Eastern Shore. Yeah, I know. We've we've got it. We've got a great national name um, to us, and I think that you'll really enjoy the experience when you come down this July. And since you've been living in Baltimore for a few years, you'll be prepared for the heat. So <laughs> we don't have to I'm warn you about really that. Really looking forward. I understand that there's some water near you. Oh yeah, oh yeah. There's there's plenty of water as well. Maybe we'll get you out on a sailboat or something too. Right, or maybe I can go in. <laughs> oh yeah, you can swim too. Stay yeah, in totally. California. You're gonna go in. We can hook you up with all, right. all that well, stuff. Um, real quick, uh, Julia, just one last question before we go, and I'm sure you've kind of said this uh, th- throughout the interview, but I just wanted to just end on this maybe note. The difference between looking at a 19th century portrait and, uh, you know, when you come over this summer, looking at something that was painted on an eastern shore landscape um, in the last two hours. Can you talk about the appreciation uh, between those two type of things? Well, I love what Al said. One, um, the the one that's being painted in front of you or has just been painted, it feels so immediate and fresh, and you can smell the paint, and you can smell the the turpentine, and you can you really feel part of the process. And I think that is something that um, we we need to remember about older art is that it was always contemporary you know it was contemporary art at at some time all art is contemporary when it is made and so both making the connection between now and then but also making that connection between then and now is something i think we we all need to remember and and feel and experience and and appreciate so i love that sense of connectivity and um the sense that those smells and that immediacy should actually not just remind us of where we are right now, but where we have been. And and again, where we're going, I know that sounds really trite, but I I am very interested in the trajectory of the moment and how it, how it makes us think differently about the past and the future. Well, and these paintings are capturing, I mean, even in 16 years at Plenary Easton, we talk about the paintings that were created that could no longer be painted because that specific landscape has changed. 
You know, I mean, it, we're, we're, we're part of a changing landscape, whether it's through development or whether it's through nature or, well, you know, the, the, the landscape is changing and we're creating a historical record of that as the festival prog- progresses. I mean, it, I'm not sure what other place, you know, you can have so many paintings created in the same two weeks in July for years and years and years and years. You're just this one very controlled moment every year in which the same activity is happening. Um, and it creates this consistency over time. But as you say, the result is going to be incredibly wide ranging. Well, and, and you know, we, we, we've noticed that too, in the, in the styles of the paintings, you know, the, the, um, the East Coast plein air movement has gotten so much more abstract than some of the, you know, the, the, the paintings fathers that were, you know, part of more of that California look. You know, we've seen a lot of that abstraction start at plein air East and the, the much larger canvases is another thing. They're not quick little sketches anymore. They can be really sizable paintings. But that's part of the this sort of change moment that's happening um, as the festival continues to progress and the, the painters continue to grow. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's going to be fascinating to see what happens with that and and where that change will take you next year. And absolutely. Into absolutely. Julia, thank you again so much for your time. We look forward to meeting you in person this July. Um, and and we, we should come up to the Walters and take a look around. I would love that. We, we look forward to seeing you before July. That sounds like a that sounds like a great plan. Thanks again for everything. We appreciate it. Thank you. And um, I really am so honored to have been asked to do this. So thank you to you. Thank you to all the painters and just and the artists. And I can't wait to see and meet everyone. The Plein Air Easton podcast is brought to you by the Avalon Foundation and was produced by Nick Richards. Our theme music was generously provided by Blue Dot Sessions with additional episode music by A.A. Alto. Remember to rate, comment, and subscribe. You can learn more about Plan Air Easton at planairisten.com.